this talk about uh, some of the things that are ongoing in our laboratory. And given that we have been doing this thing for now uh, 16, 17 years, our lab, which is called LISA for Laboratory for Intelligent and Safe Automobiles, uh, turned 16 last year. Uh, and that's uh, people who do driving and all. The youngsters would remember that there is a big incentive to turn 16, is uh, whether you can drive or not. And we have been spending time figuring out uh, whether you need to drive or not. Uh, and so we'll share some of those ideas. And then uh, hopefully the conversation will begin and we'll be able to do some group thinking. So basically, the things that I want to cover in the first uh, part of this presentation is uh, we would like us to keep thinking in our own minds uh, that uh, these are automobiles. Uh, we would like to say that they're intelligent, uh, but we would also like to think about robots and uh, autonomous robots. And is an intelligent vehicle same as intelligent robot or not, autonomous robot or not? We would also like to think about something that generally, when people talk about uh, developing these self-driving vehicles and autonomous driving related things, they don't emphasize as much, is what about you and me? When these robots are so smart that they are going to do it everything on their own, uh, is there a role for us when we are going to be living, say, 20 years, 30 years, or 100 years from now, uh, what would happen to the species that we are from? We would also like to say that uh, I am, just let it out, uh, not very objective. I do want to see a role for me, my children, my grandchildren, and people of my kind in that future. So I would like to formulate this problem where I would say that there is a relevant and useful role for us to play. And if we want to play this thing, we better come up with some frameworks where we will have to make sure that the intelligence which is coming out in our computers, in our vehicles, in our overall environment, uh, and the intelligence that we have, they can actually formulate a team which would be synergistically better than what could be just one agent's intelligence. So, and then I will also share with you some of the things that we have done and give you some flavor for the things which happen just 10, 15 miles from here. And I do want to say this, that it's one of a kind laboratory. It's probably the longest serving lab uh, in the world which has pursued this emphasis on safe and intelligence simultaneously. And uh, there were about 100 PhDs, uh, postdocs, and other faculty members who have participated in this quest over the last 15, 16 years. Uh, these are different versions of that. And I also want to say that uh, we are the reigning uh, lead institution of uh, intelligent uh, vehicles related work uh, uh, in the world. Uh, and this is kind of an Oscar for the, uh, our field. And uh, we got it in 2015. And in 2016, they said that there wasn't they could not choose another one to match probably something which was going on with the other. So it's, it's uh, quite a group that some of you may want to uh, come visit and actually do something uh, collaboratively. So what do we do? Uh, very simply, there are these four things that we have been pursuing for the last close to now 20 years. Uh, that the big picture is that we want to come up with approaches for doing mobility in safe, stress-free, efficient, enjoyable manner. And all of those things are important, but safe is something that we have pursued without any compromises. We also think that on a general machine intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence perspective, this is a great area for us to work because we think that the future, whether you are driving or not, uh, would require us to come up with ways in which you and your machines can cohabit this planet. Uh, and that is a key thing that we would like to really bring out. And to do that, there is a particular kind of a framework where we put theoretical problems, we do experimental sciences, and then evaluation where we like to distribute the intelligent capabilities of different agents uh, 
systematically, and we come up with things which are, again, to prevent accidents. So it's not just to describe uh, what's going on at that particular moment, but it is a predictive system, so it has to figure out what would happen in the next five seconds, two seconds, or 10 seconds, so that I can guarantee that the future will be safe. And we would like to also say that when we started our uh, group uh, uh, in 2002, this particular lab, uh, we had an agenda for five years. And we said that let's pick up some of these things and we will come up with answers to them. Uh, five became 10, 10 became 15, and it's going on. And now those who are graduating from our labs and all that, we know that they have a 30-year plan of their own to work on it. So this is still an open area. So what is that we have as our humankind uh, have anticipated or pursued in terms of looking for autonomous systems? So this is coming from something which was published in 1956. Uh, and this was just the idea that you might be going out on a freeway which would have uh, your checkers or uh, chess or whatever you like to do, and then you just keep on cruising on beautiful California highways. And that was where things kind of stayed with us, but then there are serious people, and this is one of our colleagues. He is in his 70s, but Ernst Dickman, he spent about 25, 30 years of his career developing vehicles that in the 80s and 90s were doing autobahn driving at uh, 60 miles per hour, uh, and this is one of his uh, slides. Uh, but we were not keeping, we meaning the US uh, scientists were not out of that particular uh, quest also. So there was this vehicle which was done by some of our colleagues, uh, led by Professor Takio Kanade, who by the way this year got the Kyoto Prize, and he was here last month, where this particular vehicle, which was called NavLab uh, in uh, CMU, it drove from Pittsburgh to San Diego with about 95% fully autonomous manner in 1990s. And then this is some of their logs that they were keeping. There were no things called blogs, but as you can read some of those numbers, you will find out that some of the stretches that they would do which would go 99% autonomously. So we need to start thinking that these things were happening 20 years ago, and what has happened that justifies us to keep doing things that we do now. So this one I will skip, but uh, this is from some of our colleagues at Berkeley, led by Professor Praveen Varaya, and he is a top-notch control theorist, uh, and he wrote a very classic paper in the field and which said that in order for these things to be safe uh, uh, and efficient on the highways, uh, you must do one thing, is that take the humans out, because he said that in order for these things to work without uh, causing some uh, oscillations and all that, you cannot have human reaction which is going to interfere with uh, uh, controllers. And uh, this became one of the mantras, and they actually put together, and some of you might know those who are San Diego uh, natives or who have spent some time that in 1997, uh, they had uh, over the 13 mile stretch of Interstate 15, uh, they drove eight vehicles in a platform platoon, which were autonomous uh, and, and nice things were shown. Unfortunately, for some good reasons, and we can get into that in the Q&A, it failed, that nobody really came back and they said that what should we do now that you have spent $100 million, 10 years of effort and did this thing, uh, and that kind of went away. But then there was kind of a rebirth of some of these things. And in 2014, uh, some of the things started happening in European end as well as in the US, and this is a vehicle which, is, which drove uh, uh, from uh, the birthplace of uh, Daimler Chrysler's first vehicle uh, to uh, his wife's, the in-law's place, uh, and then they actually put together a system which was uh, uh, replicating that path autonomously. But let me show you, you are going to see a person, Ralph Hartwich, uh, who was uh, working with us uh, since 2001, and uh, he became head of the Autonomous Systems Group for uh, uh, Mercedes. This was on 60 Minutes uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, let me move on. You got a picture of it. Uh, 
And then people are already talking about doing things uh, where the cockpit would look like somebody's living room or office space. Uh, and just when does it happen? Uh, we will have to come up with our own answer. But at the same time, there are some people now getting very serious and asking people like us who are interested in buying these things. Uh, and it turns out that this is one of the most uh, respected, uh, serious uh, thousands of people survey that was conducted by University of Michigan a few years ago. And they started asking questions that if you have to do a primary mode of mobility using autonomous driving, uh, do you have some concerns? And as you will see, that for people in the US, uh, about 90% of the people had some concerns. In India, by the way, only 5% had concern, which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, uh, if you are trying to write a business plan, and you say that 90% of the people really are not sold on this idea, probably it will be difficult for you to really justify this thing. So we remember that. We also now start looking at things which are not robotic, but now these are the things that you and I can buy. And this particular one, uh, as you can possibly tell, which particular car is this? Uh, but as you see it from their ads and from their websites, uh, it is promoting uh, the type of thing that uh, Ralph was doing uh, in his uh, prototype. But this is not a prototype. This is for reals, made available in 2014. And things are going quite well until about a year ago. That something which happened tragically for somebody who had spent few years in San Diego, in Coronado, he lost his life in Florida, driving that particular vehicle and colliding with an 18-wheeler. But the interesting thing, the vehicle did not stop for another couple of kilometers. Now, we keep that thing in mind as we set up our own place to contribute to. So we need to ask questions. So what will it take for us to buy a vehicle, which is a robotic vehicle, as a primary mode of transportation, not for doing some uh, joyride once in a while. So there might be numbers, and these are just my suggestions for us to think about how much do we want to pay for it. And I used to use this thing a year ago. Some of the people that I know, they bought over 30,000 vehicle, which had quite a bit of those capabilities. You may say that I want to have a certain speed, that it has to be efficient and all that. And the number that you see for urban streets, in some sense, uh, the people who are making this, they say that if you go beyond 15 miles per hour, we don't know whether it is doable or not. But that number is much smaller than on highways. Uh, and you need to go from urban street to highway. So what would happen there? But then this other thing, which really was not discussed until about year ago uh, uh, was a question that I have said there. They said, what is that your tolerance about safety? Would you say that it has to be 100% safe, or it has to be 80% safe, or it has to be 99% safe? And you can come up with different numbers, but I can assure you that it's never going to be 100% safe. Okay. And there will be issues like this, that what happens if this robot makes a mistake? But even one other thing which is not thought about, but a lot of research is needed, that does the robot even refuse to have you interact? And then would it even have the self-awareness to tell that it has made a mistake? It will keep on driving for two kilometers before it comes to a halt. So now let's say that in order for us to do the types of things that we want to do, we need to really think about this thing holistically. So we know that there are humans in the car. The robot better know that there are intelligent agents in the car. And what are they doing? What are they, uh, how are they feeling? What is their risk tolerance? What is their comfort level? What is their attentive level? All of that needs to be continuously monitored and interpret it in the robot's consciousness. But then there will be people who are actually going to be in and around the vehicle. 
and there could be a police officer who is asking you to stop, stop, stop. And this vehicle may not know what does this mean. He says that go, go on the other side. What does it mean? Uh, you better need to have that thing, otherwise there will be bad things which happen. And then there will be people around you, they are not going to necessarily have your autonomous driving vehicle, and they are going to do certain things uh, without knowing, or sometimes even maliciously. And do you know? Would your system be able to figure out that this is really something that I need to be aware of? And what should be my action after that? So those are the types of things that we want to do. And the basic premise is this, that for this AI systems, uh, people, some of you would know, that when it came, the people coined this word in the Dartmouth Symposium in 1956, and basically said that if you can do something that the humans do, that would be called AI, right? And the, the, uh, the other thoughts, I can I come up with a trajectory of how to drop a bomb? Oh, that is great if you can solve those differential equations, intelligence. Then they say, no, 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 I want to do something which might require me to play chess, and grandmasters were defeated by it after 30 years. Or there might be things where can it understand the language I speak, so jeopardy questions can be answered and all that. But all of those things are in some sense extremely narrowly focused and signal analysis type of things Really, for you and me, when we want to be intelligent, uh, we really like to understand each other. And by understanding each other, hopefully we are learning and improving our own intelligence. And if we are going to make machines which are intelligent, then they are something that they need to understand what I am thinking, what I am intending to do, what I am going to do. And by the same token, I need to have a very good understanding that the vehicle hasn't really figured out that there is an 18-wheeler in front of me. And that kind of a communication at a higher level of semantics where both of us can understand each other's, we share the, basically the consciousness. How would we do that? It's a tough question. But fortunately, we were exposed to some people who do ethnography and anthropology, where they go to places which are far remote in the Southern Pacific, like Margaret and me did, and they said, how does this tribal community transact some intelligent things, which might be, I mean, how do they navigate over three months in rough seas, come back in little boats? That is intelligence, how do they do that? How do they trade? How do they marry? How do they do whatever they do? And many of them don't even have a written language. So fortunately, one of our colleagues, uh, Ed Hutchins from Cognitive Science Department, 30, 40, 40 years ago, while he was a grad student, he did some of these things and he came up with a framework which is called Cognition in the Wild. And for that, basically, his assistant professor, he just became that, he won a MacArthur Award, which is called Genius Grant. But interestingly, that was a key observation. He said that, you know, these things happen in interactions, and we may not know, but if we observe it, then maybe we can learn. And he started doing those things for battleships, he started doing this thing for jumbo jets and Airbus 300s, and those cockpits were designed based upon some of his work. And when we started doing that, I said, Ed, we need to do this thing in the car. He said, no, I don't know, touch it. <laughs> these are too complex, things happen so fast, and we don't know how to observe things. So he said, don't worry, we will be able to actually build experimental vehicles where we constantly look inside the vehicle, outside the vehicle, and nature of the vehicle, state itself, dynamics, uh, in synchrony, continuously. And then we'll figure out, once we can collect this data, can we do some machine learning, and then start coming up with patterns which might say that, hey, if this thing is happening in this large, thousand-dimensional measurement space, that is an indication that this thing is going to change lane in two seconds, three seconds. It's going to merge, it's going to overtake, it's going to do something. And that was basically the thing, and we started building these vehicles, and now we are in the sixth one, which is going to start, uh, which will come in a couple of weeks. Uh, but this was one of the ones that you would see in some of the videos and all that, but the idea was that we will actually put these things, uh, and these are one of a kind. There are no copies of this thing uh, other than our sponsors have uh, uh, been given. But typically what you see in the bottom part, these are the ones that are in the, some of the systems that are being sold. 
uh, Teslas, the Googles, the Mercedes, the Audis, they have basically that kind of stuff in variety of uh, configurations. But what was unique about UCSD, that from day one, we were also observing what is going on in the cockpit, uh, what people are doing. And now it turns out that people who were doing only observation of the vehicle and the surround itself are realizing that 99.9% .9 is not good enough. It's that one particular thing, and we think there is something for us to contribute well, to. So more than a decade, the University of California, San Diego, has helped pioneer a new paradigm in automotive engineering with a vision of human-centered, holistic driver safety. What are those things that we can do from the technology point of view of developing new types of sensing systems, architectures, uh, as well as interfaces, uh, which would allow us to do that is our job. Professor Mohan Trivedi leads UCSD's Laboratory for Intelligent and Safe Automobiles, and the lab has established novel R&D programs with some of the largest automakers in the world, including Nissan, Toyota, Mercedes, Volkswagen, and Audi. They have funded a series of projects that, taken together, have resulted in a new framework that Trivedi calls LILO, short for Looking In, Looking Out using a diversity of sensors and computer vision algorithms to monitor the environment in and around the car, including the status of the driver. Case in point, the UCSD researchers developed a system which automatically and correctly can predict a driver's intent to change lanes, his intent to overtake another vehicle, or to merge safely and smoothly a full two seconds before the driver actually makes the move. The system effectively learns telltale signs of the individual driver, including when and how he looks into the mirror to judge whether a car may get in the way of changing lanes. The system was part of a project with VW, then in 2009 its sister company Audi turned to Professor Trivedi and his team with a new challenge focused on driving in the world's biggest cities. How do we develop a safer, comfortable, convenient uh, systems uh, so that uh, uh, drivers would really drive in urban areas uh, without getting too much stressed. And what are those things that we can develop in terms of intelligent systems uh, which would assist the driver, especially as they maneuver through urban traffic? The result, a three-year Audi Urban Intelligent Assist Initiative announced in January 2011. But now when we do these things, uh, I think the issues are, what are, I'm trying to show with this very simple slide, that in order for us to really be convinced that this is something that I want, uh, we are now talking about winning the trust. It's just like negotiating between two agencies. Uh, I want to buy a house from you, I want to marry you, I want to do whatever key thing is that they need to be trustworthy. And if these things are there, then there is a very fine line which is going to say that do the technology matches the trust that we have. And if we give too much, tr put too much trust in it, bad things can happen and you can get into crash. Uh, if we do a little less trust there, then it might be something that uh, the system might really, you can get uh, frustrated, the machines will work in an uh, inefficient manner. So one of the key things that in order for us to win the trust of individual drivers and must make sure that no two people drive alike, I don't drive the same way in the morning versus on a Saturday. And all of us do that and the car need to be intelligent enough to do that kind of a personalization, otherwise trust is lost. And then we start realizing that the types of things that we want to observe are not even talked about when in my own previous work on biometrics and all that we will expect that people are going to stand in front of a white background and give you a beautiful picture of their faces smiling and all that and you process that. This is not going to happen. You're going to see things which are going to be occluded, eliminated differently, things which are going to happen too fast. And it's not just the face I want to see, I want to see what is happening with their hands, whether they are doing their uh, uh, texting or whatever is going on. And all of those things uh, 
need to be captured, and that is something we have been doing. And other thing that, as I was just talking to Mike just a few minutes ago, he said that, yeah, but what happens on the side might be also of interesting, and that's also something that our students have been looking at, and what do they do? So they say that when I go outside, and this is right outside our lab, and when we turn it on, we see lots of students, especially when the classes are uh, changing, uh, and they are doing all these things, but many of them, they are not even aware of a car which is only two feet away from them, because they got their things going on, and their situational awareness is somewhere on the other side of the planet, probably, talking to their friends and the family in China. But the car needs to figure this one out, because now we are going to have these things going. So, so this is my last slide here. I just want to come back to the big agenda that we have said. And those of you who are interested in uh, learning the technical details of it, uh, our lab is considered to be the most uh, uh, prolific in the field and also most cited in the field. So if you just go to that particular website, you will see all of our papers. Uh, we make a special effort to uh, put every accepted paper on our website. So you're welcome to get the technical details from it. Thank you so much. And I was thinking something I'd like to start with is um, what is motivating you to do this kind of research? I mean, you know, we can see that it's exciting, it's interesting, but why are you doing this? Why are other people in this field working on this kind of question? Very good. Uh, so it's easier for me to say why I'm doing that rather than why others are. Uh, but I think there are basically two uh, reasons. Uh, uh, one is really uh, things which is, uh, there are some important artificial intelligence related issues when we are developing improved uh, or enhanced levels of intelligence in systems. And typically there are people who might address that by doing things either in a fully theoretical manner or maybe using some simulations or uh, experiments which are so sterile of reality that there is no real generalizational capability of what they find. Uh, the light changes, the room changes, the background changes, and things fall apart. Uh, so we have always been experimentalists, that we wanted to do things in real life. And to conduct these experiments, it turns out that uh, an experiment which involves uh, life and death situations uh, are those where you cannot really fake your re reactions or your uh, uh, actions. And that was very good because a lot of times in our experimental work in AI, uh, people would question whether this thing was really naturalistic or not. So this thing happens. So that is one of the reasons that there are fundamental problems in AI that we wanted to make progress on and show it in the real world that it is working. But on the other hand, uh, having something which is really going to save somebody's life was something which was an extremely uh, exciting, but really something that I did not work towards, but that benefit just fell in our lap. And I think I can ask, and I do this thing all the time in the audience, that are there people here who either in their own family or somebody they know who was involved in some bad accident or not, and almost everybody in the room raises things. I raise it twice because two of my cousins died, both of them. One was 24 on the day of his graduation and celebration of his friend's birthday in New Jersey, and another one, an 18-year-old boy, parents buy him the motorcycle, and the first day he drives it out on Bombay streets, he dies. But this one is not just my thing. You will find out this thing over and over again. And here, I used to challenge our students uh, 15 years ago. I said that all I want you to do is develop something which is at least as good as a little seat belt. Because people know that a lousy little seat belt is saving day in and day out 15,500 lives every year on the US roads, and that will get multiplied by many times. I said, give you a camera, give you a computer, give you this lab, can you match this little thing? And initially, we were not there. But now I know 
that we are coming there, there every day. My kid was telling me the other day that I mean, this lane departure warning system and lane keep assist really is helpful when I'm tired and having a jet lag or something like that. And these kinds of things are happening, and so that just keeps on fueling our interest in this. So th that's great, and actually you hit on the two things I considered you might answer. One is that you're doing this out of intellectual curiosity. You want to develop better and better AI systems and figure out how to do those, and you have an opportunity here to test out in, in very real circumstances. And the second thing is that you want a technology to save lives. You aren't just looking for something so people can have the fun of saying, I can play checkers while my car drives me from one place to another. So the, the saving lives thing is one that um, intrigues me. And I don't know whether you've considered this question, because it's more a sociological question, but I'm wondering whether people in the field are considering that there is a possibility that we will be able to reduce the number of people who will die because of auto accidents once technology like this is widespread. And let's accept that. Let's assume that will happen. But how will people react if there are still deaths that occur in circumstances where if we were not using these autonomous systems, those are situations we could have protected against. So we are giving up lives in situations we could have protected against in order to have fewer losses of life total. Is this something that you've heard discussed? Or? Yes, yes, uh, uh, excellent question. And I think I like your, the way you set it up that uh, ultimately, things are going to work out. And you will be able to have the performance which is 100% safe and everybody's happy with it, uh, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. And uh, it turns out that I can relate to a project that we did about 15 years ago. And I did not think about it, but one of our sponsors came to us and they said that Washington has come up with a regulation that every car which is going to be sold from January 2014 needs to have three types of settings for the airbags. One is deploy, another is don't deploy, and third one is partial deploy, but we don't know why and how we can do this thing. I said, but what happened? He said, oh, you know, somebody came up with these numbers and they said that from 1995 to 2000, there were recorded fatalities. 195 deaths had happened because of the wrong deployment of the airbag. So it was a situation that if this young person, generally these are shorter uh, stretcher people who were sitting in the front uh, seat, uh, and this airbag gets deployed at 200 miles per hour. And if you are too close to it, or if you are holding a microphone like this, we are, it's a recorded case, person was having a Coca-Cola, and he was decapitated. But the interesting part was that if they were riding in a car which did not have that, that would not have happened. So the question was that can you actually come up with some kind of a vision system which is continuously going to monitor what is the occupant's posture and whether they are, it's safe for you to deploy, partially deploy, you can reduce the forces or not deploy at all. Now those kinds of things are going to come back in another manner in the things that we do. And one of the things which becomes harder and harder is that how do you come up with measurables which are going to give you those values that are consistently accurate for you to decide that this is the threshold where I'm going to do this or that. And it turns out that we really don't know in many of these situations how to measure the types of risks which are involved or how to measure the improvements that can be made by having this alternative decisions made. So research issues, but sometimes when I watch YouTube videos or nice little commercials, those things are not something which comes at you. It gives you a feeling that it's going to work well all the time, but there are things which we don't know how to do. Yeah, it probably never will be 100%, as, as you said. But So um, th I just saw the first question that somebody asked in the audience, and it, it relates to a, a broader question I'm going to ask before I get to this. And that's, um, this, based on your talk, it's so clear, this is not a technology that should be developed solely by engineers who are working on artificial intelligence and sensing devices. 
it sounds like you want anthropologists and sociologists and philosophers and I mean so what is the nature of the field now with your lab is are you only a bunch of engineers do you have psychologists as part of your group what what is the field like very good question uh, in my lab actually used to have a lot more multidisciplinary things in our formative first five, six years. But then it turns out for the reason of how much can we, we do, uh, we had to start focusing more and more. And right now we are very much focused on doing these holistic systems uh, which are done by mostly engineers, computer scientists. But at the same time, in the field things are changing because I think there are now programs in law schools where people are talking about how to come up with whose fault it was. There are people like philosophers. In fact, while Michael was asking me to come here, I really thought that as far as ethics is goes, there will be somebody else in the room who would know how to answer or how to frame philosophical issues there. But I certainly haven't been able to do it on my own, but I'm hoping that by raising the awareness of what is possible in technology and what is not possible uh, with things that uh, are currently available or what are expected to happen in the next five, 10 years, uh, people will get more uh, inclined to come up with their definition of how to frame those philosophical, those sociological, those policy, those legal things more precisely. But I completely agree that if you want to come up with a solution for uh, how to cut down on uh, opioid use or drug use, you don't go and ask the cartel leader <laughs> their opinion, right? I mean, so you don't want to have engineers uh, who are going to say, this is how you should solve this problem. It must be solved by general public because whether I like it or not, but most of the times I'm a parent, I'm a husband, I'm a citizen who has to be doing this most dangerous thing that I do every day is drive. And can we do this thing in socially accepted, ethically uh, reasonable approach? So, um, so I'm going to ask the specific question, and, and I, I did not write this question, and I'm not lobbying for something for me. The question is, what advantage or disadvantage might be introduced by embedding an ethicist in the context of the work you're doing? Oh, and does, do you know of anybody who's done anything like that? Yes, I think uh, there are people. Uh, in fact, uh, one of my colleagues at uh, Stanford uh, his name is Chris Gerdes, he's a top-notch control theorist, and he had a, a person who was interested in philosophy uh, from Cal Poly, who spent a year on a sabbatical there, and they have done some good work. But generally what happens is that, uh, and again, I don't want to generalize it, but uh, maybe I should say, in some of the things that I have observed, uh, is that you kind of give the ball to the other side, and say that it's your problem to solve, it's not my problem to solve. But to have that thing defined properly, you must have collaboration. And so there is an advantage there, but I think I told you about the probably the disciplinary uh, uh, differences, which can be a challenge. Also, I think when people are trying to do some of these things, is this something which can be done without having uh, experimentally viable systems to play with or not. And as soon as we do that, we start saying that, okay, I have a better sense of how to capture the state of a pedestrian or a driver or a vehicle in a mathematical logic. But if I have to start also inputting the ethical parameters into that, that a system which is going to kill a uh, elderly person versus a young person, a uh, uh, dog versus a uh, person. How do we do that thing in a mathematically uh, realizable format is difficult. Uh, and I'm not too sure that it can ever be solved, uh, but I think there are some difficulties in doing this and taking it to a level. 
It's good to have debates, but I'm not too sure that it can be shown to everybody's liking, because there will be, I think, these knobs that you talk about uh, would be required. That, I mean, if I'm doing this thing in the battlefield, my ethical knobs are at a different setting than if I'm doing this thing when I'm driving my grandchild to a uh, nursery or something like that. Yeah, so, um, so one of, there's, there are a couple of different approaches for people who are ethicists. One is to say that I'm going to give you the right answer. Um, I'm not part of that school. There's the other part, approach to ethicists is that we try and help frame questions that are important and useful to ask. And so I'm going to ask two questions of the audience. So assume you were in a self-driving car. It's your car, and it now has a choice. It's going to have to either kill somebody who is on the street, or in order to avoid them, you are going to be killed. How many of you want the car to favor you? <laughs> it's your car, you want it to favor you? <laughs> okay. How many of you want the car, to, if, you're drive, if you're walking on the street and somebody's coming along in their self-driving car, how many of you want the self-driving car to favor the driver in the car or you? <laughs> so how many would say, I would want it to favor me if I'm the one walking on the street? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I know people aren't raising their hands, but I'm seeing a lot of people are thinking that if I'm walking on the street, I don't want that self-driving car. I didn't choose to have the self-driving car, so why should, why should I even be considered? The person who's in the car should be the person who deal with this. And yet, when you ask these questions of the general population, people tend to put themselves in a particular position and want that choice. And it's not black and white. There isn't a simple nod that we can say the mathematical equation will always tell us, just dial it in here, and this is what we need to do. And it's ironic because none of us really wants to rely on the judgment of most of the population. And you, see, you know, most people, you think, I, right now you're relying on the judgment of human beings to make decisions like this. And those aren't necessarily that good either. So um, anyway, I forgot I was using the microphone. I hope you could hear some of that at the back. Um, and if you didn't, you didn't miss anything. So, um, so you talked a lot about data collection, which in part you're doing for trying to better understand what happens with, with self-driving cars, but in part because this might become part of systems we would have. So that's a lot of information that will be collected. What conversations have been out there about how much is going to be saved, how you protect from hackers being able to get uh, get into that information. What What is on the table so far? Or are people just working on the technology? Uh, excellent question. Uh, yes, a lot of data is collected and uh, transmitted almost on a continuous basis uh, to the makers of these vehicles which you and I can buy today. But almost all of it is protected by that particular uh, uh, vendor. And if you ask for your own data, you're not going to get that. And that is a major bottleneck, because uh, everybody is trying to improve their own vehicles uh, in a systematic, with real data and all that. Uh, but if they find out that there was an error, there was a uh, collision which was prevented or collision which was not prevented, uh, I would like them to tell others uh, that this is not something that uh, you should repeat that mistake. Uh, and this thing that you are saying that is it on the table or not, uh, there are people who ask each other, but uh, generally uh, in our system, uh, the people who make these products, they can protect their own things. And uh, you sign on to that when you buy this car also, that that is their data. But somebody needs to intervene in my mind uh, for the betterment of everybody. Uh, and there are places in uh, uh, national academies and all that. I was part of that 10, 15 years ago when they started basically designing experiments where we had 2,000 vehicles at six different regions in the United States running around for two years, but driven by regular people. Uh, and that data was something that was collected for use by researchers over a 15-year period. Interesting, and that thing ended in 2011, and until about six months ago, and that is the latest I can tell, our own government's regulators had not figured out whether the data which was related to people's faces 
while they actually encountered a crash or a risky situation uh, can be shared with anybody or not. And again, that one as a part of the original panel which was defining this thing, uh, we, that was understood that this will be shared. But they say that we can look at what is going around that and that also we have to anonymize the traffic signs, we have to anonymize the billboards, we have to anonymize the number plates of other vehicles. Now, when things of that nature are going to happen, uh, it's going to constrain our ability to really advance science. Yeah, so, so um, at least at this point though, you're, you're, you're pointing out that the um, industry, the automakers are controlling the data. But part of the users, part of the question that we're asked here is that there's a risk of that information being hacked, even though they're trying to keep it for themselves. So I don't know, you know, it's hard to imagine, well actually it's not that hard to imagine. There will be situations in which people might not want that information known, situations in which it might be used in a court case, um, so that it might be demanded of the auto industry. So even though they are proprietarily controlling it, there still may be ways that even now uh, it would be accessible. Yes, and uh, I don't know what do they do to protect that particular thing, but I would like to believe that I mean, uh, given uh, the direct implications to their own uh, brand, uh, they would do what they can do to, but all of us know that I mean, uh, even uh, presidents and Pentagon's computers get hacked, so uh, uh, I, I don't know. But I think one of the things which is kind of connected to that is uh, really in the safe environments that we want to go towards, uh, you don't want to really have a car which has everything collected by itself, but other cars which are around it, infrastructures which are around it, and they are going to share in this connected uh, world. Uh, and hacking and uh, spoofing uh, in those situations will happen. And we will have to build these things up uh, so the chances of those things happening are really driven down. Uh, but uh, that's why I point to these young scholars here that have been, uh, think about careers, you are going to save lives, you are going to solve some really hard problems, uh, and you will be busy for next 30, 40 years. <laughs> well, actually I would argue that they'll be busy indefinitely because this is probably very much like the, our operating systems on our computers now. We are constantly in a battle of people recognizing um, ways in which they can break in, and then the software developers have to find ways to protect against that, and we probably will have the same issue here. So I want to move on to an, another question, which is an interesting one. There are many stakeholders in this question. Um, there's the scientists we talked about, the public that wants to use these cars. Um, but what about the insurance industry? What are they saying about this? This person is asking, they see that the auto insurance company would be fighting against autonomous vehicles. Um, I, I don't, I, it seems to me that there's, there are opportunities here for them to see all kinds of ways to charge more, but, um, but what, 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 have they been part of this conversation and what are you hearing? Uh, yes, uh, again, I did not anticipate that, uh, but about five, six years ago, I get a phone call from somebody in New York and he says, hey, I'm an alum of UCSD, but I was an engineer, but now I'm vice president of one of the largest insurance companies in the world. and I." got the UCSD's alumni magazine which showed some of the things that you guys were doing, so I want to have some conversation with us. And that was the first time I thought that there was something that the insurance companies would be interested in it. Uh, but again, uh, I started realizing that as you are saying that people haven't really figured out whether this is going to help them or this is going to hurt them. Uh, but they know that this is useful. So some of our most recent graduates, one of our postdocs who was working here, he is now working for a company which was a startup probably four or five years ago, but now they have got over a few hundred people working. Uh, and they basically develop systems which can be used by other people, including insurance people, which, would, which characterize the awareness uh, of the people in the car and the situations that are uh, measured. Uh, I, I really have no direct knowledge of what their business plans are, but they are definitely uh, uh, very, uh, they are funding work in it, as well as they are observing what is coming out of it uh, with intent. Uh, uh, I'm uh, sure they're, they're yeah. paying attention. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, um, 
Good, so um, another kind of stakeholder I alluded to a little bit is that there are situations in which there could be a legal question based on information captured in these cars. Any, it, what about lawyers and uh, people that are involved in making laws, or uh, is there any conversation about uh, what's developing? Yes, uh, yes uh, in fact, uh, I shouldn't have been surprised, but the first program which is offered for uh, legal issues related to autonomous driving was established at University of Santa Clara. Uh, and uh, that was like, they had a first workshop in 2012, uh, and now it is annual event which is going on, and I'm pretty sure that there are other, Michigan probably got into that act also. So uh, lawyers and law schools are now training uh, young people uh, who are experts, or who will become experts uh, in uh, finding out uh, the liabilities and all those kinds of things. Uh, uh, but the, again, the uh, joke used to be that, I mean, it will depend whether your lawyer is uh, better paid than Google's lawyer or not. Uh, and so, but things are happening. And I think we know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, you gave us some data um, which were surprising to me. I did not expect it to be that extreme, but a really high percentage of people across the world um, are very concerned about the idea of having autonomous vehicles. And that, in, in light of this question too, that reminds me that something I see again and again is that human beings um, need very simple worldviews. And because we do, we, we grasp onto our particular ideology or beliefs, and no matter what information we're given, we don't budge from those beliefs. In fact, we will overlook information that's contradictory because it doesn't fit. And the more information we see that fits, we, we build it up. And all of us can think of many examples of that happening, in, especially in the field of science. So given that, um, is the this person is proposing that, you know, should we educate people better how dangerous driving is with humans as opposed to how dangerous it would be with an autonomous vehicle? But I'm not sure, you aren't a sociologist, um, so I'm not asking you to answer it in that way, but I guess I'm asking you are, has there been conversation about what we need to do to raise this issue and perhaps try and work on the beliefs people have, not just the data that they have? Yes, uh, I, I appreciate uh, the question. Uh, I think, wider uh, community from different perspectives would always be helpful. Uh, but I'm not too sure whether this kind of uh, preference that human beings have about data versus beliefs uh, is something that can be solved only by education or not. Because I have seen highly educated people, and like you said, in sciences also, uh, that they work very much because of their gut feeling or a belief that this is going to lead, and uh, they may be wrong. So in some sense, we need to preserve that, but I do agree that, I mean, if there needs to be education where you can make these comparisons and have that discussion involving sociologists, involving uh, uh, technologists, uh, it's a good thing. Uh, uh, it hasn't happened uh, that I can think of uh, 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 in a, a serious manner, but uh, it needs to. Uh. Thank you very much. This has been excellent.